Petro Kotin says Ukraine's Zaporizhia nuclear plant faces a serious danger of radioactive meltdown. He says he believes the Russian military occupying the plant is shelling it to disconnect it from the Ukrainian power grid and reconnect it to a power system in Russian-controlled Crimea, taking all the power with it. They have already cut three of the four connections to the Ukrainian grid, he says, and if they sever the fourth, that poses a serious nuclear risk. There's a risk of uh, losing the external power to the plant and it is dangerous because there will be then uh, blackout mode and they will be starting diesel generators and uh, if they stop then you will have like melting of uh, the nuclear core of reactors. He's asking for the plant to be declared a demilitarized zone monitored by the International Atomic Energy Agency out of control of the Russian army. The foreign ministers of the G7 group of industrialized nations agree. They say it's Russia's presence at that plant that's endangering it, and they've issued a statement demanding that Russia leave and turn over control to Ukrainian authorities. The Russians, in turn, blame the Ukrainians for putting the plant at risk by firing on the facility. Britain's defense ministry predicts the invasion is about to enter a new phase, with the heaviest fighting shifting 350 kilometers to the front line that stretches from Zaporizhia to Kherson. Nearby, in battle-scarred Mykolaiv, residents have emerged from a 54-hour curfew. They've come out to queue up for water and food in a region that's been the target of Russian bombs since the invasion began in February. Ludmila Stativka is among the thousands of displaced people evacuating Shevchenkova village near Kherson, now under Russian control. The daily bombardment is taking its toll. Of course people are afraid, but everyone is hoping that they will not reach us and things will get better. But many houses in our village are destroyed and people have died. There are 150,000 people in the city and the Red Cross says all need some kind of help. John Hendren, Al Jazeera, Kiev. For further analysis, let's bring in Michael Black, who is the director of the Centre for Nuclear Engineering at Imperial College London. He joins us from there. Hello there, Michael. Thanks so much for being on this news hour. I want to begin with the current status of the plant. Information has been difficult to verify, but it appears the facility has been attacked several times now. What are the implications of that? As I understand it, the, the attacks haven't actually directly struck the uh, reactors themselves, They've principally being uh, ancillary buildings and also the power lines that feed the reactors, provide the reactors with power to, to function. Okay, so now we're hearing that Russia has been able to or is working towards redirecting the power to Crimea. Given the vast area between the two areas, for want of a better word. How are they able to do that? Well, it's not that difficult. Electricity can be transported. I mean, most countries have grids. The electricity you get comes from a, 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 a power plant uh, perhaps hundreds of kilometres away. I don't think that's, that's a problem. I think the concern, if there is any, is uh, that it may interrupt the off-site power to the... Um, to the reactors, and I think, as was pointed out in your report prior to um, prior to this, uh, you you need that power to maintain cooling to the reactors. Uh, there are backup systems, so as you mentioned, there are diesel generators that will kick in should off-site power be stopped. And as long as they function, then everything's fine. I suppose I suppose it's it's encouraging that the Russians want to use the electricity that does imply that they don't want to damage it, but you never know in these scenarios. Yes, it's certainly a dynamic situation. So, Michael, if they're able to redirect that electricity, and as you're saying, it's relatively simple to do that, what impact would that have on the energy supply to Europe? Well, obviously, they're, they're, they're in control of that energy supply. Um, and and so, so Europe would, would, would get less, and it's already struggling. So uh, it's an issue, but, but uh, as I understand it, most of the reactors aren't running, haven't been running. I don't think Europe is depending on it at this point. It has bigger problems as regards to the energy crisis, possibly, than, than uh, the Saporizhia uh, reactors. Right. And, and given the 
current moves by Russia, do they violate international protocols? And what would happen if this behaviour continues? I think there is a great concern that, that nuclear reactors are run very carefully according to strict protocols. And um, as, as I understand it, this is being managed by Russians and it's Ukrainians uh, that are keeping the reactor going. Um, it, it begs the question whether um, the proper maintenance schedule, schedules are being carried out and repairs are being carried out, the day-to-day -day maintenance. If that's not happening, then you do start to worry that backup systems, for instance, might not function when they're needed. So it would be, it would be a hugely important step if the uh, Russians would allow the IAEA some access just in order to assess the situation. OK. Well, we appreciate your insights on this issue, Michael Black, Black the Director of the Centre for Nuclear Eng Engineering at Imperial College London. Thank you. Thank you.